Welcome back to the Ing Lit Hit. We're taking another break from our series in Ozymandias to focus on Macbeth, and specifically the symbol of sleeplessness. The word sleep appears in every one of Shakespeare's plays, and Macbeth comes out top with 23 references, with Richard III, 19, and A Midsummer Night's Dream, 18, following in second and third. Our overarching question is this, does Macbeth's sleeplessness, or insomnia, symbolise his guilt, or does it represent the increasing uncertainty and insecurity surrounding his reign, or both? These are distinct interpretations of the motif of sleep within the play. Our plan is to explore sleep as a symbol of psychological innocence, sleep as a symbol of social order, the character's insomnia as a consequence of corruption, subversion and insecurity, and finally, the conflation or the merging of sleep and death. First then, sleep as a symbol of psychological innocence. Sleep is said to symbolise a clear conscience, and its antithesis, insomnia or sleeplessness, as an indication of guilt. In Act 2, Scene 2, we see this most clearly when Macbeth says the following. Methought I heard a voice cry, Sleep no more, Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labour's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. Look at the bit I've put in bold, the innocent sleep. This is the maxim, a short statement of truth, if you like, which acts as a structural hinge for the connection between Macbeth's claim that he has heard a voice cry and the images he depicts in trying to describe the psychological effects of sleep. Can you see how Shakespeare uses the language of cleansing and healing here to act as a metaphorical description of sleep? It knits up the raveled sleeve of care. It is the death of each day's life. We might be tempted to think of death as a negative image, but remember what Macbeth says in Act 3, Scene 2. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. As death is the eternal rest from life, think R.I.P. Sleep is the rest from day. We will return to this idea later in the video when we explore the close relationship between death and sleep, but it is clear that Duncan is the polar opposite of Macbeth, though weak, is preserved as innocent in his eternal sleep. He was murdered in his sleep and continues to sleep in his death. The third image Macbeth evokes, then, is sore labour's bath. We've all been there, we've had a long, hard day at school, we've just been out for a ten-mile run, absolutely exhausted, giving it our all, and what we crave is a bath to loosen up the muscles and relax. Well, Macbeth, and indeed those living in the Jacobean era, would have viewed sleep in this way. But not content with those three images, Macbeth goes on to describe it as the balm of hurt minds. If you've never used tiger balm when you've got a headache, you haven't lived. And finally, he's the metaphor of a meal or feast and describes sleep as the second course and the chief nourisher. Clearly, sleep is viewed as remedial, even necessary to healthy living. But it's not just a physical benefit. It is important to understand that for the Jacobeans, a healthy night's sleep was inextricably, absolutely and necessarily linked to a healthy psychological state, and thus, innocence. We see this in two ways. Firstly, in the explicit maxim that the innocent sleep, and in the assertion that Macbeth shall sleep no more. It is not that this is something inflicted on Macbeth by an outside force. Here we are reminded of the question of agency. Is Macbeth a pawn of fate? or an agent of free will. Well, I think Shakespeare might point us to the fact that Glams, that's Macbeth, hath murdered sleep. He is responsible for his actions. The lack of sleep is connected to his overwhelming guilt as the party wholly responsible for the grossest act, regicide. Secondly, though, throughout this scene, Macbeth is also obsessed with another common motif in the play, blood. He says... Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? He is led to think that all of the water in the world cannot cleanse the blood from his hands. 
If this isn't a metaphor for his guilt, I don't know what is. We're left with the vast image of the multitudinous seas in Carnadine, reddened by the consequences of Macbeth's actions. Quite evidently, sleep is a symbol of innocence, and Macbeth, following Duncan's murder, is lacking thereof. We see it later too, don't we, in Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking. She is racked by guilt and is highly agitated in her sleep. Out, damned spot! So there is a strong case for arguing that sleep is a recurring motif of innocence. Secondly, and more briefly then, let's explore how sleep could be a symbol of social order. We know that the murder of Duncan disrupts the natural hierarchy, throws the great chain of being into disarray. A Jacobean audience would have recognised the act of treason as the mark of a hugely dysfunctional society. We see this in lots of ways, but here's one. In Act 2, Scene 4, the old man says, A falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl, hawked at and killed. It's unnatural for an owl, representing Macbeth as the inferior thane of Glam's, to kill a falcon, representing Duncan as the king. There are many more examples of the natural order being disrupted by the Macbeth's actions. And one of these is the effects it has on sleep, not only for them personally, but for the country of Scotland as a whole. An unnamed lord talks of how Macduff has sought the help of the English to overthrow Macbeth's tyranny, when he says in Act 3, Scene 6, Give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets bloody knives. It's not coincidental that where sleeplessness is cited as a consequence of social disorder, the bloody knives of his regime go hand in hand with it. The destruction of normality, the subversion of order, necessarily causes insomnia, not only for the leader, but also for the nation. Thirdly, we'll now look at how the character's insomnia is a consequence of corruption, subversion and insecurity. Did you notice how I've said characters rather than the Macbeths? Well, crucially, we see it too in Banquo's response to the witch's prophecies, as well as that of the Macbeths. Macbeth states in his famous Is This a Dagger soliloquy that wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. And likewise, Banquo says that I would not sleep. Merciful powers restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Both are haunted by the dreams of ambition that have been stirred up by their encounter with the witches. It's obviously worth noting again that Macbeth acts on these, and Banquo doesn't, but both find their sleep disrupted by what a Jacobean audience may have perceived as wicked thoughts, if not necessarily treasonous in Banquo's case, then definitely irreligious, ungodly and sinful. It is interesting that Lady Macbeth's collusion with spirits and her desire for them to unsex me here, seemingly yields certain nonchalance and apathy in her response to the murder of Duncan. To begin with, she seems unfazed by the evil of her actions. She commands Macbeth to sleep. You lack the season of all natures, sleep. This is ironic, as she later descends into an incredibly troubled sleep of her own. It is particularly ironic, because her last word is sleep, before her two-act hiatus and then her reintroduction by the gentlewoman as I've seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, or afterwards seal it and again return to bed, yet all this while in a most fast sleep. She is agitated beyond belief. Look at the verbs in bold. Particularly for one who was so confident of the solution to Macbeth's woes in Act 3. Sleep, Macbeth. That'll sort it. Shakespeare's message? Well... Could he be saying that if one intends to corrupt, subvert, or destabilise the natural order, then by golly, your sleep is going to be affected. You will be haunted by your misdemeanours. Finally, and very quickly, let's consider how sleep and death are conflated or merged as concepts throughout the play. While sleep and death do go hand in hand throughout Macbeth, King Duncan is murdered while sleeping peacefully, Macbeth is unable to sleep due to his murderous actions. Lady Macbeth commits suicide in her sleep. Macduff draws a distinction between them. Downy sleep is death's counterfeit. 
as he alerts Bagquo, Malcolm and Donald Bain to Duncan's murder. Real death is horror. While sleep acts as a symbol of innocence and purity and its opposite, insomnia, acts as a symbol of guilt and disorder, we can be clear on one thing. Where sleep is disrupted, death is at work. If you liked this video, please subscribe below.